As of end of October 2020, Spotify has 320 million users worldwide, 144 million of which use the premium service and pay their monthly fee. And I think the company is worth about 50 billion dollars at the moment. And yet, literature uh, on this hegemonic platform, so to speak, is relatively scarce. However, there's one book that had a wider impact and made the news of the music, press and traditional media as well in the art sections. It's called The Spotify Teardown Inside the Black Box of Music Streaming, written by five young scholars in Sweden. It was published by the renowned MIT Press for Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This book provoked Spotify actually to trying to stop funding the scholars. One of the five authors of Spotify Teardown is now with us, Maria Eriksson, a postdoc at Umea University in Sweden. That's about halfway up from Stockholm to the north on the coast of the Gulf of Bothnia, the northern arm of the Baltic Sea, so to speak, between Sweden and Finland. But for a year now, Maria has been a guest lecturer at the Institute for Media Studies at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And this is where she is at the moment, speaking with us in my old home country. Hoi, Maria, we got. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me. I would suggest uh, we talk about two things uh, in our conversations. Now, A, the book you co-wrote and I just held into the camera, the Spotify Teardown, and also about editorial playlists. In other words, we're going to talk less about music and more about economics, maybe a little bit, but this takes us right to your book. One of the key phrases of the book to me, and uh, I believe it was also one of the main things that uh, drew the most anger uh, at the company, uh, is as follows. Spotify is not primarily a music provider, but even more so a data broker with venture capital from around the world. What surprises me most today, like two years after its publication, is that I was surprised even. So were you surprised too during your research when finding out about this. Spotify is more of a data broker than a music provider. Well, um, n not really. I think, um, I mean, sort of for Spotify is a Swedish company and, and um, it grew out or it appeared at a time in history where um, online piracy uh, was a big, big part of the public debate uh, in Sweden. And I think because of this and because of how big this debate was, it was very clear from the start that Spotify was very much a commercially driven uh, business and a, a counterpart to sort of non-commercial ways of uh, distributing music uh, online. And as we started sort of digging deeper into the, the history of Spotify, this also became uh, even more apparent. Um, Spotify's two founders, uh, Daniel Ek and Matten Lorenson, for example, they didn't have backgrounds within um, traditional music industries uh, as such um, and were rather sort of classic startup tech entrepreneurs who had become uh, multi-millionaires uh, in the online advertisement business uh, before. And I think that it's, it's important to remember that this is essentially Spotify's uh, sort of origins, <laughs> the, ad, the ad tech industry or uh, that's where it grew out of um, to a large extent. Well, that's one side of the origins of Spotify, right? I mean, it didn't hit Germany, I think, until 2012, although there were better versions um, of the service already around 2007, I think. But it actually started, uh, I think, more like a file sharing model, barely legal in the very beginning. So Spotify as pirate, so to speak, do those origins still reverberate with the company today somehow? You know, the narrative of not enumerating everybody the same way. Mm, yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely true. Sort of in the beta stages, um, Spotify was essentially a, a pirate service, and it also borrowed much of its technology from sort of the file sharing scenes and and built its distributed network around peer-to-peer uh, -peer technologies, for example. Um, but today, uh, this is sort of all gone, and and I think that it would be incorrect to describe Spotify as anything but sort of corporate mainstream player. And and today, some of Spotify's most uh, important business partners, who they also collaborate with to a very big extent, is is uh, is major record labels. Um, but it is, as you say, also true that sort of um, Spotify has certainly been surrounded by ongoing debates about its. Um, 
how it distributes uh, royalties uh, among artists and 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 uh, so from the perspective of sort of musicians and performing artists, I, I think that it might certainly be the case that Spotify still appears as somewhat of a pirate or, you know, um, uh, um, uh, an actor that doesn't um, deal quite fairly um, with, with, uh, with uh, musicians, um, for sure. Oh, there's definitely uh, huge companies uh, that are affiliated with a uh, company. I think uh, the Deutsche Bank has quite a lot of capital uh, in, in that company also, where, you know, where we're speaking from here from Berlin. But the approach you and your colleagues uh, chose was uh, ethnographic or even activist uh, in some way, because you decided you could not gain access to the company as researchers uh, as you wanted. You know, like journalists in general, they do not even answer requests of any kind, at least not here in Berlin. So you acted as players in the field, as artists uh, almost. Can you something, can you tell us a little bit something about that experience, how you sort of designed uh, uh, that artist, that activist, that ethnographic approach in order to, um, you know, get deeper into the subject of what Spotify mm. is really about? Yeah, so I think sort of at the beginning of our research project, we approached Spotify through fairly traditional, you know, means. We tried to do interviews and, and meet with Spotify employees, but we quick, quickly discovered that there was a very clear limit to what these um, employees were either willing or sort of able to share with us. And and as a response to this, we, we decided to, to explore what could be learned about Spotify from the outside. Uh, from an outside perspective, in in a sense, or uh, not by talking to to Spotify directly. Um, and one of the strategies that we used for this was to release music and sounds on Spotify as well as other um, streaming services, and launch sort of what you could call like an, an a record label for academic re research purposes. Um, and we used this as a way to to get insights about the process. Um, through which, you know, recorded sounds are transformed into these stream music experiences. Uh, so how music is tagged and prepared to be treated and, and, and evaluated by um, the various algorithmic system, systems that are at play at, at, in Spotify, at Spotify, for example. So um, by doing this, this also gave us, this gave us sort of hands-on experience of what it is like to interact with Spotify as an independent uh, artist or, or musician. And it also gave us the opportunity to study the various tools for self-monitoring and sort of self-surveillance that uh, artists who use um, the platforms are, are also offered um, today, which we found really interesting. Uh, and uh, sort of aside from uh, releasing this music, we also engaged in other methodological experiments. Um, like we developed software plugins for Spotify, um, and we also used bots or pre-programmed scripts to study um, Spotify's music recommendation systems. Um, so in this book, in, in Spotify Teardown, we, we frame these experiments as a type of methodological interventions, and and for us. Um, they, they really gave us a, a very stimulating way of sort of learning more about Spotify, not just by interviewing its employees or reading more about how the company presents itself, uh, but sort of by actively engaging uh, with the platform and, and, and testing it out. And, and that was um, very productive and, and, and uh, fun. Mm. I can't say it enough. I really think this is mandatory reading for anybody who wants to dig a little deeper into what the company is about and how it functions and the history of the company and everything. But um, still, a lot of the times when I talk to independent labels or artists about streaming in the last four to five years, I, I get much more positive reaction, to my surprise, actually. Many like the sense of empowerment I get, you know, because they can publish their own lists, their own radios uh, and so forth. And of course, they very much like the idea of the back catalog that is ready at hand, you know, the back catalog that is in stock. So whenever a new album gets traction of a label or of an artist, the older one uh, gets more plays too. Uh, and that shows in revenues uh, a little bit, even for mid-sized uh, independent labels here in Berlin. That's the sort of information I get when I talk to them. So uh, I don't know where that really is from. I mean, do you see that too, that uh, this critical approach you chose is one thing, but, but you know, independent artists actually like about Spotify? What do you say to them? 
Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't doubt that Spotify has been beneficial for, for many um, uh, artists and, and labels. And I, I do believe that in many ways, you know, it has made it a lot easier uh, for artists to have their music released to the public and also sort of gain control and overview of, uh, of their um, their work and 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 and, and their audiences, um, and it, it has certainly lowered the thresholds for getting music out to the public. And uh, but I think that doesn't mean that we shouldn't also ask critical questions about what is going on um, at this platform. And I think um, even if I, I don't see a, a, a conflict in in both sort of recognizing that Spotify has. Um, done a lot of things that many artists appreciate um, and also sort of um, digging into or asking questions about the power dynamics that of course also play out uh, on, on this platform and, and that's what something that we try to do in, in, in this book and I think if you look at um, uh, common news media especially in a place like Sweden where which was sort of the context where this uh, book was written um, it's, I, I, I think that Spotify has received an overwhelmingly um, huge amount of, of sort of good press. Uh, and and um, I think that needs, it's important to balance that out, especially as, as um, a platform like Spotify grows and has become as, as big as it is um, today. Then we also need to start asking other and perhaps more uh, critical questions about what they're doing. Oh, absolutely. I think that um, accounts for Germany as well, even though Germans are, um, like to think they're very critical of data mining uh, and data privacy and things like that. The Spotify also got an overwhelmingly uh, positive press coverage in many ways, mm. especially since its launch in, in 2012 uh, and the following years after. One of the things that's been talked about a lot and you talk about uh, in your book with your colleagues also are the terms of service. Um, some of these are you know, outright illegal. They would not hold uh, before a court, actually. And you've experienced that uh, with your uh, group of researchers, as you have shown. I'm sure the company must know that. They can pay the best lawyers in the world, uh, uh, in the US uh, uh, and here in Europe. Why would they still do that? And you think that relationship sort of has colonial aspects, almost, when those terms of services actually do not correspond, um, you know, with national law in the countries uh, where the service is available, actually. Why would they do that? Mm. So I think, I mean, so just, just sort of to be clear, um, so Spotify threatened to take legal action against our research team um, because of some of the methods that we've used uh, during our uh, four or five years of research. Uh, and it, it, this was because they claimed that we had violated their terms of service agreements. And um, there was, there's, there's basically no doubt about that. Uh, we had violated these uh, terms of service agreements, but these documents, which are also like the agreements that you usually read before you sign up to any uh, online service that are endlessly long and you usually you know, just click I accept and, and move on kind of this, these are the doc these are the, the terms of service agreements that Spotify was referring to. And and these really long documents contain um, a bunch of different regulations that for example forbid um, the possibility to to copy and archive any part of the Spotify platform and, and simple things like that that are essential to research uh, and journalism as well um, for that matter. Um, so I, I, I think that uh, it should be said that sort of when this uh, <laughs> legal story played out, um, Spotify was just about to enter sort of the stock market and was therefore likely sort of extra protective of its uh, sort of public reputation. But, but sort of having said that, there's also no doubt that Spotify was trying to intimidate and, and to some extent silence um, our research. And this is something that we take very seriously. Um, it's important to realize that these terms of service agreements, they are corporate documents and, and online platforms like Spotify can formulate these documents in what pretty much whatever way they wish. There's no governmental oversight over how they are uh, written. And if violating these agreements could be considered a legal offense, this would give uh, online platforms and corporations an unprecedented power to dictate law, uh, essentially. Um, and I, I think that Spotify's actions against our research team really illustrates the necessity of safeguarding the, the freedom of 
experimental academic research and journalism um, sort of in the online domain and 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 the the, the right to to tinker with and and exper experiment with uh, platforms and technologies that have a profound impact on uh, our everyday life playlists as we have talked about in this series uh, already and a lot of your research focuses in that too curatorial uh, playlists are the main tool uh, spotify wants you to find music with and more and more of those playlists are ai driven right they're not manually curated they're ai driven not all of them but more and more um, so this sort of corresponds with the claim of the company that they are for greater diversity in music like uh, more more independent uh, are artists, more unknown artists, they're going to make more well-known, less stars, more discovery. Uh, now, is that correct? And if it's correct, why? Well, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely not sure um, if, if, if I could say or, or agree that sort of AI curated playlists equals more indie, um, less stars, more discovery, uh, etc. And, and to be honest, uh, after studying, um, even after studying Spotify for five years, uh, I'm still not sure of how their music recommendation systems really work. Uh, and even if my conception of how it worked might have been fairly correct uh, and accurate at some point in time, uh, it's very likely that much have changed today. Yeah. Um, and this is, of course, no accident. You know, Spotify wants to keep its um, music recommendation tricks um, secret, and is of course also developing these recommendation system um, systems continuously. So I think it's very difficult to to speculate about that. Now, I'd like to quote um, something that you wrote. Um, with tens of millions of followers, Spotify's editorial playlists now reach a broader audience than most radio stations, even in large markets such as the US. It therefore comes as no surprise that Spotify currently describes its editorial playlists as its top real estate. Quote end. Now, if we go back in history uh, of pop music a little bit, you know, if we look at influential radio DJs uh, made playlists that could break records, actually, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s. And I remember also many compilation albums that followed the concept of a mood-based playlist. I've talked uh, with that in Robert Prey uh, from the Netherlands in this series, actually. You know, music for candlelight, dinners, parties at home, uh, chart toppers of 76 or 77 and so forth. They have been around all the time. What is the main difference today to playlist containers apart from scale? Of course, the scale is much bigger when we talk about editorial playlists on Spotify. But what, how would you describe the difference uh, of quality, actually, of a radio DJ who breaks a record and a recommendation service by Spotify? Um, well, I think probably the, the, the biggest difference um, is sort of the, the dynamic nature of playlists and, and how they provide ongoing statistical oversights over um, music consumption. Um, I see editorial playlists as, as key entities that help Spotify control and monitor listening practices uh, on the platform. Um, for example, these uh, mood playlists that you mentioned that are built around, you know, activities like or, or themes like calm vibes or um, life sucks or uh, whatever it may be. Um, these playlists are deeply sort of embedded in behavioral marketing and, and allow Spotify to to sell uh, artists or user segments to, to um, advertisers uh, based on their uh, emotional states and, and their habits uh, and so on. So in this case, uh, playlists are part of sort of broader strategies of commodifying listeners' uh, emotional and, and sort of intimate relationships with music uh, in an ongoing way and, and in, a, in a way that I think is different from um, analog uh, playlist uh, recommendations, for example. Um, I, I also think that um, sort of the dynamic nature of, of playlists and how they allow um, Spotify to to control um, uh, how users listen, for example, by regulating skip uh, the amount, how many times they can skip songs and, and if or if not, they, they may listen to songs in shuffle mode or whatever it may be. These subtle and small um, tricks and tools for um, to, uh, sort of adjusting how, how users listen and to and, and access music, I think, are, are really important and really sets um, 
online playlists apart from from their uh, non digital counterparts. Yeah. Another difference uh, would be how the different labels or you know holders of rights are enumerated actually right I mean this is a controversial topic and has been for years that uh, we suspect or well we know uh, that major labels get uh, a lot more money uh, when they're promoted in the playlists than independent labels do right but this is something if I'm informed correctly that's happened with iTunes and Apple music also and we've talked about this for such a long time and now it happens again with Spotify I mean how can this happen for such a long time there's even AI generated music probably that doesn't have to be remunerated at all in uh, some of those playlists but this is something that's happened for so long do you see that happening elsewhere uh, also or is this something very specific to Spotify in how they make those deals with different players in the field? I have not studied um, this in any detail on, on, and compared Spotify to other platforms, but I have no reason to believe why Spotify would be um, more drawn to these um, semi-moral <laughs> um, uh, sort of ways of, of uh, creating and, and uh, playlists and, 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 uh, and uh, paying uh, artists a fair amount of, of royalties and so on than other platforms. Um, I, 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 the, po the point of sort of our research, I think, is not to pinpoint Spotify as a particularly evil company in, in any way. I, I think um, we really tried to use Spotify as a lens through which we could talk about this uh, sort of broader tendency or a broader um, category of, of um, major players in, in the music industries that, that exist online. And um, it was a, a, a productive sort of um, way to enter into those conversations. But um, I don't think Spotify is, is worse than anyone else, or I don't have any reason to believe that they are. Hmm. Do you think there is a chance of policy, of national policy, of European policy that could change anything in that respect? I mean, European, Com European Commission now uh, discusses the Digital Services Act that is actually quite radical uh, in a lot of ways. It promotes, uh, I mean, the text is not written yet, but I think it should come out in December, actually, uh, when we are aired. Um, it uh, promotes interoperability. Uh, something that is uh, uh, very crucial to a lot of uh, app services and uh, it would mean something for streaming platforms also right you could actually force platforms to open up their services with other services that would be quite of a radical uh, outcome you what are your hopes in let's say European policies in dealing with those platforms <laughs> um, well I haven't looked closer at the specific new um, uh, uh, law that you mentioned, but um, I think um, I think there probably could also be m many more things done in, in the sort of broader uh, sense in, in when it comes to transparency and, and the transparency of of um, recommendation systems and and and, and uh, ar artificial intelligence online that makes um, important. Um, decisions for us in, in our everyday lives and, and ranks information and and um, and uh, evaluates us in, in many different ways, not just as uh, consumers and, and users of music, but uh, listeners to music, but but also as, um, uh, you know, all citizens in a broad uh, sense. And um, and I do think that there's um, there's certainly space to and many important conversations to be had around that around um, accountability and, and transparency with regards to uh, automated or semi-automated um, recommendation systems and and uh, and uh, information ranking systems online. That would be comparable to the page rank algorithm with Google, something that is uh, heavily contested. And what the platforms would say, you know this, uh, they'd say, well, you attack our business model. Our algorithms hmm. uh, have to kept secret. Uh, nobody in the company actually knows how the algorithm works. There's probably different groups, uh, you know, where the algorithm is uh, put together. Hardly anybody knows uh, what exactly comes together for the page rank algorithm, for example, uh, with Google. Same thing uh, for Spotify. What would you say to them if they say, no, it can happen. This is our business model. This is the heart of our business model. I understand that it is. And, and I think that's um, 
it's it's not surprising that this is the response that we get from these um, major tech companies. But um, I, I still think that we need we need to put, continue to to push for this. I'm not saying that. Um, Absolutely, everything should be put out on the table, and, and all uh, all secrets should be revealed. But there should be some level, some basic level of, of openness and transparency with regards to how how these uh, systems work. And uh, I think um, simply because when when um, when they have so much influence uh, over over our everyday lives, we 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 also have the, should also have the right to to understand um, the logics according to which they are built. Um, on some level. Second to last question, Maria. Do you think, um, again, European policy could change something? Do you have hopes that um, Europe is going to change something in that game? I know it's a small player uh, compared to the big uh, you know, tech giants in China and in the US, but uh, there's a lot of policy going on right now in Europe. Do you think it's gonna, they're going to change something in that respect? Um, I don't know. I'm I'm following. Um, um, I think it's interesting, not least um, uh, to follow the the uh, sort of developments around how and where these um, uh, big companies pay pay their taxes and <laughs> and how that's um, distributed across across the earth. And I think that's a um, a very um, fairly uh, simple and easily uh, accessible way of perhaps making um, the digital sphere in the world a bit more equal. Um, and uh, that's, uh, I, I think that's the most um, um, probable um, space where something could happen quite soon. Attacking them with taxes. Okay, now there's the oldest trick yeah. in the pop book. Uh, you, you know it, we call it payola. We call it pay for play. It's happened for decades actually in the pop business. Now we talk about also manipulated playlists on Spotify. Sometimes allegedly by the company itself, you know, inserting fake or cheap artists in order to lower costs in very prominent and popular playlists with millions and millions of followers. Sometimes also by bots or click farms. In the latter case, my impression is, and many people in the industry actually that Spotify is not very open to prosecuting these cases and I wonder why wouldn't it help their reputation if they were more aggressive in prosecuting um, you know blunt fakes let's say a German hip-hop artist who all of a sudden is number one in uh, Shanghai I mean that happened before and everybody knew uh, this is this was done by man manipulation because it can't be that a German hip-hop act is number one in Shanghai how would this happen except for bots except by manipulations but it's happened and Spotify to my knowledge did nothing about that why that's a really good question and I've been asking myself that as well <laughs> I think it certainly would benefit Spotify if it would show that it takes um, these uh, attempts of, of, of sort of manipulation um, um, seriously um, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure why um, why I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm clueless as to why um, they haven't made <laughs> a public um, a process out of this. Um, perhaps um, in some ways, um, no, no, I cannot speculate. I, I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I they think, should hire yeah. you. Have they ever tried hiring you after you wrote that book because you knew so much about the company? This would be a classic capitalist move to make, actually, to hire yeah, the critics. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that hasn't happened. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad they didn't, so we can keep on this conversation maybe one time live here in Berlin. Uh, I think we can do this again without Zoom, but still, it was uh, a lot of fun talking to you. Thank you for being with us. Maria Eriksson in Basel.